All right, we are in week number 102 in our series from the Beloved, our, um, our lesson in John's Gospel. Uh, we are in John chapter 18, and before we get into that, just a couple of, of review points. Um, as Jesus has begun the journey to the cross, he has done so with, with full readiness of what is to come. His uh, preparation that we've, we've really talked about over the last several weeks from John 13 through John 17, his preparation has included counsel and advice that he's given to his disciples and a time of prayer. Now, we are actually given the, the full kind of um, method of that prayer in the high priestly prayer, and um, we, we get a kind of a glimpse of, of what that prayer looks looks like in, in actuality in the Garden of Gethsemane in the Synoptic Gospels. But he's anticipated, he's anticipated this moment of crucifixion. Now, it's not just an anticipation, but he's also been in submission to this moment because he knows that this is the Father's will. And I see you, Sharon. That means it's too loud. Give me one second. I got you. I don't know who's using this, but some soft-spoken person. How's that? Better? Now I can yell a little bit more. It's always a lot more fun for me. Um, but he's done this in full, not just anticipation and knowledge, but submitting to the Father's will. He's submitted um, knowing that he's going to be arrested, knowing that he's going to be tortured and put to death. And so he goes to this gar the Garden of Gethsemane, this, this olive press, this olive garden, to begin the reversal of what began in the Garden of Eden. We talked about the image of the garden in John's gospel as it surrounds the arrest and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus as a tie and a parallel with the garden that's mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. Now, in this readiness, we understand that who holds the power to what's happening? It's all in Jesus' power. If you knew... That people were coming to arrest you right now. Would you stay where you are? Would you go and do the things that you normally do? No, you wouldn't do that. You would flee. You would go and do things that are out of the ordinary. And yet Jesus, with full knowledge of what's going on, he attends to his normal routine eats with his disciples, prays with his disciples, teaches his disciples, and goes to the garden where Judas Iscariot knows he often goes. He doesn't avoid it. It was not a trap. Jesus could have run, could have done something out of the ordinary to thwart the schemes of Judas and the guards. Listen, Jesus at this moment has supporters. We know Jesus has supporters. Lots and lots of supporters. People who would have hidden him. People who would have taken him in. And yet he utilizes none of that. He also demonstrates his power in the garden. We saw this last week by use of the divine name. Remember in John chapter 18, the guards show up. And we're going to talk just a second about what that looked like because we didn't really get into that last week. The guards show up and Jesus asks the question, whom do you seek? And what do they say? What is their response? Jesus of Nazareth. So they use human name, human location. Which is fine. That's who they're seeking. They're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. And what is Jesus' response to that? He says what? I, really, what does he say? I am. We add the he part to just smooth it out. But it's ego a me, I am. Invoking, as John has shown throughout the narrative, evoking the divine name. Now, what do the, what do the guards do at this, at this name, this mention? It says that they draw back and fall to the ground. Now, we didn't talk about this a lot last week, but I think it's important to remember. Some of you have study Bibles or study notes, and, and you probably looked up how many guards. We talked about how many guards. And I mentioned uh, that the cohort that's typically mentioned in the, with the Roman contingent, Judas, remember, he recruits arresting guards from both the, the, the Roman government, the Roman soldiers that are there, and also the temple guards. Now, there, there's more to that in just a second. But he brings out this guard. Now, how many? Some study notes will say that a cohort is between 600 and 1,000 uh, soldiers. Okay? 
So it's theoretically possible, though not likely, that Judas brought out as many as a thousand soldiers. It's not likely that that happened. It's also theoretically possible he brought out 600. Also not likely. More likely that it's in, in the, a portion of a cohort in the 100 to 200 range. Now, that's still a whole lot of soldiers. That's not to mention the temple guards, which would have been scores and scores of temple guards. Um, so what do they do? George Hudson was, and George is not here today, so that's great. Um, George came this week, came to the office, and he said, I never thought about it like that. Because when you see passion plays, or you see it uh, on, in kind of traditional movies, what do you see? You see, you know, maybe a dozen guards. You know, 12, 13 guards. They come into the garden with their, with their, their lanterns and with their, uh, their, you know, their, their torches and their, their swords. And then they go get Jesus. Now, that's because we think about it. We're like, well, it's just one person, right? But remember we said last week, one of the reasons that Judas would have been able to get even a hundred or more guards from the Roman government is because the Roman people are, are, the Roman government is, they're always anticipating a riot, especially at Passover, because the people are confronted with this pagan government at the holiest of holy of days, where they are coming to make sacrifices and the population of Jerusalem swells because all the Jewish people are down there. And it's, 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 it's a situation that's ripe for an attempted coup on the Roman government. So they bring in more, uh, you know, more soldiers. And because Jesus had already brought with him a parade of people when he enters Jerusalem, shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, He's on kind of the watch list of the Roman people. Now, this garden, it's not gigantic. It's not small either. If you believe that the Garden of Gethsemane is where, where we typically think of it today, some scholars believe it's in a different location. But even still, it's a big garden, but not gigantic. Um, think about, about twice the size of the uh, Barnett uh, Park. In, right off of Lake Mirror. Think about twice that size. So how do you get hundreds and hundreds of Roman soldiers in there? You don't. They actually surround it, and Jesus comes out. Jesus actually comes out to meet them. And he says, whom do you seek? He comes out. Doesn't try to hide. Again, doesn't try to run. And he, they say, Jesus of Nazareth. He responds with, I am. He holds all the cards. He holds all the cards. And so... He is in complete and utter control. Why is this important? Remember what Jesus says. Nobody takes my life. But what? I lay it down willingly. I can lay it down, he says, and I can take it back up again. And both of those things come to pass ultimately in Jesus' uh, in Jesus' uh, passion. At this, the narrative shifts in the Garden of Gethsemane. I want to, let's read from... Uh, verse 7. This is chapter 18, verse 7. This is the repetition of Jesus asking, whom do they seek? Uh, whom, whom do the, the guards seek? He asked them again. This is after they fall to the ground. He asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had, spoke, had spoken, of those whom you, have get, you gave me, I have lost not one. So the scene is the, the scene of interrogation and, and investigation is repeated. Only this time the difference is the guards don't fall to the ground. And Jesus then uses this second occasion of self-disclosure to protect his disciples. Um, he advocates because remember uh jesus is considered potentially an enemy of the religious institution and the roman government now both institutions are represented in the arresting guards but who holds the real power it's the roman government in this moment jesus being the uh the centerpiece of a potential riot all of his followers that are present in the garden would have been uh, up for arrest by the Roman the Roman government as well too. They they don't have like a kind of a you know 
they don't have the, the standard by which you must have a reason to arrest someone. You know, if, if, if somebody comes to arrest you, you've got, they must have a warrant. They must have a reason to arrest you. There must be a, a, an imminent danger or cause to arrest you. In this case, the Romans can just say, hey, you're, you're here. You're, you're here. I'm going to arrest everybody here because you're here. Um, regardless of where your loyalties and affiliation lie, you're in danger of being arrested in that moment. Jesus knows this and he says, let these men go. What he says is, to protect, not to protect the disciples in fulfillment of what he's already spoken. If you go back to John chapter 17, verse 12, for just a moment, uh, Jesus says in that prayer, while I was with them, those that the Father has given him, I kept them in your name, which you gave me. Look, he says, I have guarded them and not lost one of them, uh, except the one that's been lost, the son of destruction. He's talking about Judas Iscariot. Um, and that, again, is based on previous things that Jesus has said. Chapter 6, verse 39. Chapter 10, verse 28. And, of course, the exception is Judas. Verbalized in those verses in chapter 17, verse 12. And what, what's, what's interesting is that that he says in verse uh, 17, verse 12, shows up in the garden, and he could say, I've protected them, but this guy's on the outside. He's on the outside because he's betrayed me. He's in the act of betrayal right at this moment. Um, this is not a substitution for eternal salvation. This is, in the moment, the physical protection of his disciples as an illustration of the eternal protection that he provides his disciples as well. Now, as is the case often when Jesus says something or does something, uh, somebody in his inner circle steps up to do something stupid. And it's almost always Peter. I love Peter because he's always doing something stupid. We can relate because we're always doing something stupid. Jesus is trying to protect his disciples. I want you to get this. Jesus is trying to protect his disciples, and yet Peter steps up to try to protect Jesus. It says in verse, uh, verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me this incident is reported in the synoptic gospels every one of the synoptic gospels peter um the the failures of peter are pretty much universally attested in all the gospels uh this moment uh the moment of, of peter's denial the moment of the prediction of peter's denial also all kind of outlined in all the Gospels. The one exception to that would be, the, and we'll talk about this in a moment, the earlier uh, time where Peter tries to get Jesus to quiet down about predictions about his own death, and Jesus calls Peter Satan. That's the one exception. It's only recorded in Matthew's Gospel. We'll get, that, uh, get to that in just a moment. Let's talk about the scene for just a second. The scene is set. Jesus and, and his disciples are outside awaiting for the rest of, of Jesus. Jesus is asking for protection from his disciples. Peter steps up with the sword. Now, what kind of sword is it? Uh, if you care about such things, we're not talking about a giant uh, Roman kind of saber. We're talking about maybe, maybe a dagger, like about this size, about 12 inches, not super long. The other thing, too, is the detail about the right ear. It's not just an ear. He cuts off the right ear. Some scholars have indicated that if Peter was uh, right-handed, uh, that he's probably going to actually do mortal harm to Malchus, the servant. And he's aiming for his neck or his head, which means that he is a terrible shot. It's unlikely he was aiming for his right ear if he's actually trying to protect Jesus. 
it's it's highly unlikely that if Peter is legitimately trying to do uh, damage, that he's aiming for his right ear. But the the detail that John gives in these few verses adds emphasis to its historical weight. Uh, John, not known for being the most historical, not that it's ahistorical, but it's it's not it's the, theological history. He gets into the details to 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 give those who might question its authenticity in the kind of original writing, the opportunity to go back and question the people about whom he's writing. So he cuts off the right ear of the high priest's servant. Now, John also adds the detail of the servant's name, Malchus. Why is that important? The high priest is a very specific office at a very specific time in this period of Jewish history in Jerusalem. It would not have been difficult for someone to say, oh, I know Malchus, let me ask him about this incident. Or not even ask him, let's see if he's missing a right ear. Which he wouldn't have been, why? Because the synoptics tell us that Jesus did what? Healed it. But you want to believe that it would have made an impression on Malchus to say, yeah, my right ear was cut off, and in fact, Jesus did heal it miraculously. Now, John does not record the healing. But Jesus heals Malchus because had he not healed Malchus, Peter would have definitely been arrested at that point. Yeah, Bruce. Uh, it's whoever's probably closest to him. That's probably probably what's happening there. But that little those details John adds so that those who are questioning the authenticity of the narrative have an opportunity to test the details against the eyewitness accounts. They can actually find the eyewitness account. Um, the, uh, uh, the gospel according to Luke also records that it's his right ear. And uh, also with Matthew's gospel uh, advises that Peter put away the sword. Now what's different in Peter's um, or in different in Matthew's rendering of Jesus' command to put away the sword. What's absent from John's? What does Jesus say to Peter as well as, shall I not drink from the cup? What does he say? You guys know the... the... Put your sword in the sheath. Why? Because those who, in Matthew's gospel, live by the sword, die by the sword. So it's proverbial. Whereas in John's gospel, he goes back to the cup uh, that he is going to drink. Now, um, here, John is focusing the attention on Jesus. And he talks about, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter's bravery is not only stupid and useless it's a denial of the work that Jesus was called to do. It's once again Peter acting, thinking he's acting on behalf of Jesus' best interest, but actually acting against the very will of the Father. Now what John does not record is the, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. What's the language that Jesus uses is in the prayer of the Garden of Gethsemane? He prays to the Father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup... Pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And here, John picks up that language. John picks up that language of the cup. And yet Jesus is, is demonstrating his firm commitment to the mission. Even in the face of arrest and, pos and, and ultimate crucifixion. And in the lack of understanding of his closest followers. Again, this is not the first time that Peter has demonstrated a total lack of understanding of what Jesus came to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in Matthew chapter 16, in one of the most famous moments of Peter's uh, stupidity, uh, Peter uh, earlier, Peter makes this grand declaration of faith. Jesus asks the question, this is at Caesarea Philippi, um, he says, who do the people say that I am? And then the disciples answer. They say, some people say you're uh, a, a, the, one of the, Elijah or one of the prophets or you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Jesus returns and says, well, what, who do you say that I am? And Peter, as a representative of the disciples, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father is in heaven. This is a great high water moment for Peter and for the disciples. 
And he says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And then the very next scene, Jesus predicts his death. He says, I, we're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'll be killed. And Peter, in this moment, this kind of high, I'm, I'm the rock now. I'm going to, the gates of hell cannot overcome what I, you know, bind or loose on earth. And so he pulls Jesus aside and he says, Jesus, you can't, you can't talk like this. And then Jesus turns around. He doesn't call him the rock anymore. He says, you are Satan. Get behind me. Low moment. High, low. Peter, in that moment, is trying to deny the work of Jesus Christ, the ultimate mission and submission of Jesus Christ to the will of the Father. And here, G uh, Peter is doing the exact same thing. Um, in that instance, in Matthew 16, Peter calling or Jesus calling Peter Satan, it, it, it means he's again acting on behalf of that rebellious nature and attitude of the world thinking that he is going to establish some sort of a civic uh, kind of uh, leadership in Jesus Christ, not understanding that Jesus comes with greater spiritual authority and something else in mind. So from there, the scene shifts. They're in the garden. He's been interrogated. He's been uh, tried to protect his disciples. Peter has tried to uh, protect him in a, a kind of an ill-formed way. And then the she scene shifts in verse 12. It says in verse 12, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So once again, John is giving us some additional historic details as he describes the, the shifting of the action. Shifting from the Garden of Gethsemane, now moving back into the city gates of Jerusalem. John makes it plain, once again, who is doing the arresting. The arresting uh, group of guards are comprised of both Roman soldiers and Jewish guards. I said this last week, I'll say it again. Thus, John is laying the blame of the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus, not just on the Jews, though they hold special indictment, but on representatives from both the Gentile and the Jewish community, thus the entire world. Who turns against Jesus? Everybody. The whole world turns against Jesus. Um, the arrest is to send Jesus both to a religious trial, a spiritual trial, and a civil trial. Um, they move first to the home of Ananias. Now, how do we know it's the home of, An or of Annas? Sorry, how do we know it's the home of Annas? John is the only person that records this event. Uh, Luke's gospel uh, records an interview that Jesus has with Herod Antipas. John does not record that. Now, the, the history of the high priesthood in the first century, uh, and even before the first century, but, but through the early church is kind of complicated. Annas was the high priest from about AD 6 to AD 15. Um, the Roman government deposed Annas. They did not like him in that position. But according to Jewish law, how long was the high priest supposed to remain the high priest? His entire life. And so this pagan imperial government is defying the law of God by deposing Annas. And so the Jewish people, a lot of the Jewish people still considered Annas the high priest, even when Caiaphas became the high priest. They considered the Roman uh, dispos or dispossession of the high priesthood uh, invalid and continued to give Annas great respect. In the book of Acts, um, they actually call him the high priest. And so they may be doing so on this count. Now, 
Annas had officially kind of uh, been exited from that role, but his influence continued through his son-in-law, Caiaphas, who's mentioned here, the current high priest, and also through his five sons who were high priests for various lengths of time for various reasons. Yeah, Jeff. Servant of either Caiaphas or Annas, depending on our understanding of what uh, what position John is taking. The Greek, the way most of our uh, English translations render it, is it's calling Caiaphas the high priest, but the Greek is a little bit squishy. So the 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 designation of high priest could have been applied to Annas at this point, even though Caiaphas was the quote unquote official high priest. Does John recognize him as the high priest, or does John recognize Caiaphas as oh, who does John recognize as the high priest? Because again, if the Jewish people think that the Romans have overstepped their bounds, which they have by taking Annas out of that role, some Jewish people still considered Annas the high priest. That's why the Jewish guards don't just take him to Caiaphas; they take him to Annas because Annas is the one that really holds all of the. The, the kind of the political cards here in this moment. It's also the power of Annas is one of the re reasons the, the Romans um, deposed him. They didn't like him having so, having so much power. They, they didn't think it was, was help, uh, good for their control of, of the region for Annas to have so much power. But regardless, he still, um, still could have. Annas was wealthy and powerful uh, but Josephus, uh, the later Jewish historian, does not think of Annas in very uh, good terms. Um, now, interestingly, what they ultimately accuse Jesus of is that, that, that causes him to be um, put to death is blasphemy. This is a capital case. This is a case that would result in execution. Now, when that takes place, that's supposed to happen in, in, in the presence of a multitude of judges, not just one person. It's supposed to not just be one person's job to judge that case. And so what we're starting to see is that in all these situations, Jesus is being uh, kind of trumped up in a kangaroo court. It's not legitimate. They're going to crucify Jesus no matter what comes out. Um, and so what we're getting here is not that Jesus is being taken to the Sanhedrin at this point. He's been taken to the private home of, of, of Annas and Caiaphas uh, is, is along for the ride. Now, John mentions a little, an interesting aside here about Caiaphas. Caiaphas, if you've been with us in this uh, series, in John chapter 11, verse 49, he actually predicts that Jesus would die. Um, so if you, if you open up your Bibles to that, he talks about it's better for one person to die than for, uh, it's, it's chapter 11, verse 49 and 50. We're not going to read the whole thing, but it actually calls it a prophecy. It actually calls it a prophecy. And it's not that, that John is giving Caiaphas a lot of spiritual authority, but, all, but to emphasize the fact that this is a foreordained outcome. Not just from a, 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 a civic standpoint or a religious standpoint, but from the eternal standpoint of God's uh, providence. Um, this is the, the divine power is at play even amongst the authorities who are acting on in, 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 with sinful intentions. So Annas and Caiaphas are going to be the first ones to hear uh, Jesus um, in this sequence of court appearances. And I, I use that term court very loosely. I want to stop there because I know it's only five after ten, but I want to stop um, and see if anyone has any questions. And then next week, I really want to get into the interplay between uh, the, the scene with Caiaphas and Annas and the, the scene with Peter and the other disciple. There's a lot of discussion that's gonna, that we need to have about that, so I don't want to dig into that too much um, uh, right now. Uh, any questions related to this? So the action definitely is picking up. Where we've been for four chapters in a lot of of, of lessons and prayers and dialogue and, and and monologue from Jesus. Now it's action. It's 
It's movement to the garden. It's arrest. It's trial before Annas. It's the first denial of Peter. Trial before Annas. The second and third denial of Peter. Then he moves into a civic trial. I mean, so we're starting to see a lot more uh, quick action in John's gospel. Any questions related to that? I know you'll have many later that you'll email me about, which is fine, but just giving you the opportunity now. Okay, well, let's pray, and, uh, and next week we'll, we'll continue on, uh, starting with verse 15. Gracious God, we are grateful uh, for your love for us, and we ask that uh, as we consider the power that you have, remembering that you came in, in so much humility in a small stable in Bethlehem and, and lived a, a humble life, the life of a servant. You came to serve and, and not to be served. Help us to remember that in that, you displayed tremendous power because it wasn't a life that was taken. It was a life that was given, that you gave for our behalf. Help us to be grateful, especially during this season, for all that you have given for us and ask how we can respond in light of your generosity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, blessings, everybody.